Dobra jutro. <laughs> That's all my Croatian. I'm done now on the Croatian side of things. Um, I'd like to start with some thank yous. Thank you, first of all, to Petar Lukacic, who invited me to the conference. He's over there somewhere, I think. Um, to Ida for all the organization of the overall conference. Most importantly, to Carlo, who drove me here safely this morning. Um, it seems like a wonderful conference so far. I know how much goes into organizing these sorts of events because I run my own UX conference in the UK every year. So um, I bow to you for all the work you've put in. I know it's an incredible amount. Um, this is my first time in Croatia. I hope to be back because I leave this evening. So I don't even get a chance to have any beer or, or drink or anything. So that's a shame. Okay, at lunchtime, some beer. Okay, good. Um, my name is Andy, Andy Priestner. I'm a trainer and a consultant, and I've been doing this work for about four, four to five years now, and I used to be in libraries. Before I move on to my next slide, I just wanted to mention the title of my, course, um, of my presentation, which is User Experience. Some people call this stuff UX, user experience. Other people call it service design or design thinking. For me, it's all the same thing. It's just we come at it from different directions with different definitions. And sometimes that's a problem because people get confused about what we're talking about. But from my perspective, it's all the same thing. It's all about researching and designing so that we make more relevant and important um, used libraries. Okay, so a bit about me. I used to be a librarian. I've done everything. I used to shelve books. I used to um, order books from other libraries. I even used to process them and put covers on them. Um, and I worked in public and university libraries for 20 years. And I led a UX innovation program across all of the libraries at the University of Cambridge. That sounds terribly grand and wonderful, doesn't it? Cambridge. Oh. Must have been great. Well, Cambridge is great if you don't want anything to change. I wanted everything to change because I thought it was old fashioned. There was too much relying on heritage and tradition and old buildings like the ones you can see. And I wanted it to be about a great user experience. And Cambridge was far too, the phrase resting on its laurels. It was just happy to be what it was and not move forward. And I could see it was falling behind other universities and I wanted to help it. So I led this innovation program across all of the libraries there, and everyone hated me. <laughs> well, not, not true, but they struggled because I was asking them to change and they didn't think they needed to. I now consult and train in user experience globally. Um, since 2017, I've been a freelance UX consultant and trainer and have completed library consultancies in all of those countries. Particularly Sweden. I don't know why they like me so much in Sweden, but they do. Um, I think it's because they're quite direct, and I'm quite direct. Or they might mistake me for a Swede because of my hair. I don't know. Um, I was in Sweden last year, and I trained 400 public library staff in how to use these methods so that they could transform their library services across Stockholm City. So I spent a lot of last year in Stockholm. Um, as I say, in public libraries. So I understand your world, and I'm passionate about the sort of changes that can be made to public libraries to make them more accessible, more significant, more relevant to their users. I'm very passionate about sharing UX knowledge. I get very handsy like this, you know, and I'm like, this is so important. I really do believe in this stuff. I'm not an evil consultant who's just trying to get money. I actually really care about libraries, and that's why I went to start to go around the world teaching this stuff. I created and chair the UX in Libraries conference, which is held in the UK every year, and which Petter attended um, earlier this year. During the pandemic, because I wasn't getting any work, a bit of online work, but not anything in libraries where I was physically going to them, I wrote what I hope is the definitive text on UX work in libraries a handbook of user experience research and design in libraries, available at all good bookshops now. Uh, it, it is a good book. And I look at it and think, oh, God, I wrote this. I'm quite surprised. But um, it's not in Croatian, I'm afraid, unless anyone wants to translate. But um, hopefully some of you could get some understanding from it. 
I wanted to go back in time to my road to Damascus moment, the moment at which I thought, this is what is going to drive the rest of my life in terms of my career. The moment when I realized that UX was something I needed to grab with both hands. I ran a library service at Cambridge University at the business school. It was a big service. It had lots of demanding MBA students. And every year, they'd fill in the library survey, and they'd say, oh, we love your library. We think it's the best. And I ran the library, and I knew it wasn't great. I knew it didn't have enough budget. I knew there were things that people didn't really know about or didn't use properly. I didn't think the library that I ran looked businessy enough. It felt to me like a school library. It felt very old-fashioned and wooden. And I wanted it to be all glass and chrome and feel more like modern. Um, and in the survey, everyone was saying, no, it's fine. But then I started to discover these other methods, user experience methods, or UX for short. And these methods basically are about talking and listening to users and non-users and observing their behaviors in order to discover what their needs really are, rather than guessing or relying on my own experience or on very basic surveys which tell you very little. I discovered, when I started to use these methods, that a lot of people did not like the library at all. Loads of people. And they were confused by it. And crucially, because I'd gone to people who hadn't used the library as well, they were like, oh god, yeah, we never go in there, it's awful. So through these methods, I discovered so much more than I'd ever found out about my library. And I found, most of all, that I could offer better and more relevant services by involving users in the process of library service design, by testing things with them, by getting them to try things out, by prototyping, by researching, getting them involved in building the service so it was more relevant to them. So it was like this moment when the, the heavens opened. I was like, this is it. This is what I've been missing as a librarian. So what I really think is that library staff need to climb down from their pedestals, from their monuments, more often than they do, and not just hold on to their experience and think, I know everything. I know what's good for the users. And instead, climb down and opus openly and honestly say, I don't know. I don't know what my users want. I don't know everything about them. Let's find out. And it's this admission, this willingness to learn, that I think is the starting point for user experience work and service design work and design thinking work. It's about saying, let's find out what users are really thinking and doing and what they really need. So this is my version of the UX process that um, simplifies it. You start with research. You move forward into data analysis when you research, sorry, the data you've gathered, you start to code it and you sort it and you analyze it. Then, ideation, you generate ideas. We do that very poorly. There are lots of ways of doing idea generation really well. And finally, prototyping, we need to get active. We need to try out new services physically in the library, even though they're incomplete and we haven't invested in them. So they're the four basic stages. We're familiar with the idea of research, but until recently, most of us haven't gone much beyond surveys. And that's a problem. Because as I said, surveys will tell you very little, and not necessarily the whole truth. We're familiar with gathering data, but we're not very good at sorting or analyzing it. We don't spend enough time generating ideas. We also don't do it well. And finally, we rarely take the time to test new services to see if they fail or not. We just launch them and then are surprised when, when people don't like them or don't use them. And that's a problem. This last stage here is really important. This is not just true in libraries. It's a global problem. When it comes to new services and products, people don't test services or products, not enough. And that's why we experience so many UX fails in our everyday lives. So I'm just going to go through some failures, which are to do with people not testing. Most services we interact with on a daily basis have never been tested on the people that will actually use them. So here are some examples. So I had a lovely holiday with my family in the Lake District. Has anyone been to the Lake District? 
No, gosh. <laughs> they need to... Oh, oh, Goran has. Good. Well, thank you, Goran. Um, in um, the UK, it's a gorgeous area with lots of lakes and the countryside. Um, but heaven help you if you want to park there. Because this is the parking sign you're greeted with. Do you understand that? I mean, I know you, you've not all got great English, but um, <laughs> beyond it, to me, this is terrifying. And I got to this sign, I was like, what is this? What is this? Um, because it's telling you that it's a long-stay car park, but then there are different hours you can stay for, different prices. There are two columns of information. It also tells you to pay using an app, which bypasses all of this. What do you think people do when they look at this? They go away, did you say? <laughs> yeah. Or they just carry on and just try and find out how to do it from something else. There's too much information here. This reminds me of some library signs, I have to be honest. Too much information. And I stood, because I do this all the time, I'm terrible, I watch people now. Now I do UX. I stand at the side and just watch what people do. And you see people shake their head and like, oh, like this. And Anyway, um, further down you get this screen. So this is below that message. So you've got, does this make sense? It says, follow prompts. I'm English and I don't really know what prompts means. And that looks like a credit card beneath it, but I don't think it is. I think it's meant to re represent the screen. And then you've got press key. One, press key. Do I do that now? And then you've got white and yellow and other colors down there. I don't know what to do. And you've got that big sign above you as well with all these instructions. So what do you do in this situation? What would you do? Right. <laughs> Once you've stopped crying, you might probably just press the green button. And in fact, once you press the green button, you're fine. And everything will come up and you know what to do. But all of that information to get to you to that stage is just so wrong and so unhelpful. And all you actually need it's just a giant button you can press with your hand, and then it would take you into the screen where you can start to pay. But this is a problem with so many different services. They've not been tested. They haven't watched people struggle. This is another piece of bad design. Now, has this person got COVID or not? Not. It took us a while to work that out, though, didn't it? There were some people at the start of the pandemic who were like, oh my God, C's for COVID. <laughs> yeah, because that's what it could be easily, couldn't it? And what does C stand for? Does anyone know what it stands for? Control, Control yes. And T stands for? Test, but only a few of you knew that. <laughs> so test is actually saying you've got COVID. Why does test mean COVID? Anyway, terrible design. Another example, not tested with real people in the field. When I was in Stockholm, as I said, I worried for an hour that I would never be able to use the stove, the cooker, in my apartment because I couldn't work out how to open it. Um, I pressed all these different buttons and all I could get was LL. I didn't know what it meant. I think it meant locked. I eventually worked out. I looked around for an instruction manual. I never use instruction manuals ever, but I was looking for one. And eventually, I, um, I rang home. <laughs> what do I do? I can't work it out. Well, I don't know either. But um, eventually, we worked out if we pressed and held the lock key, the lock image, everything opened up. So it meant I didn't have to survive on takeaway food while I was in Stockholm. I could actually use my cooker. But terrible UX again. I like elevators, or rather I don't like elevators. Lifts, they're prob I mean, look at that one. Wow. This one's even worse. But even with simple elevators, there's problems. This one here, which you see everywhere in Sweden, always confused me. It's quite simple. You've got a, an alarm button if there's a problem. You've got to close and open the doors. Then you've got one and two. But one and two are fine if you know that you are on floor one or two. But if there's no signage, you don't know. Far better would be up or down. 
Simple things like that, that if they just watch people's confusion, if they just talk to people, they'd find out what to do. I gave a keynote in Oslo. Um, I can't talk about Oslo when I'm in Sweden. I always have to take these slides out because the Norway-Sweden rivalry is quite strong. Anyway, I can tell this story safely here. I was giving a talk in Norway, in Oslo, and I was trying to find my hotel room. You'd be surprised how many times I struggle to find my hotel room around the world. Um, why couldn't I not fi find it? I couldn't see any room numbers anywhere. So I was walking around feeling idiot, like an idiot. I said, no, I don't understand. What am I missing? And then I saw, oh, there is a do not disturb sign on that door. So it does mean that people are on this floor. I'm just being stupid. I decided I would walk back to reception, get the lift down, and tell the receptionist, I'm sorry, your hotel has broken me. I can't find my room. And as I turned, I happened to glance that the room numbers were on the floor. But I was looking for about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. And I just didn't see them. And at the conference, I said, is this a Norwegian thing? And they're like, no, this is just a weird hotel that we have here. Um, but again, really bad design that's not been tested. And then, of course, there are libraries. So many libraries that fail their users, that are too complicated, have too many signs, too many rules, too many secret ways of doing things, whether that's in the physical space or online. But maybe libraries are just really complicated and it's hard to deliver a really good user experience? Who thinks libraries are complicated? Hands in the air if you think they are. A few tentative people. I think they are. I think they're quite complicated. But I don't think it's a good enough excuse for not making a better user experience. I don't buy that idea. Charles Fillmore said, there are opportunities everywhere just as there have always been. I always believe there's an opportunity with any library to make it better. Opportunities to improve what we do. Opportunities to communicate with our users more effectively. Opportunities to make our services more useful, usable, and desirable. And UX, or user experience, is all about identifying opportunities to improve our library services. But we need to have the courage and the will to do this work. We have to want to do it. And unfortunately, a lot of library staff don't want to do it. Why? Any ideas why people don't want to do this work? They have to change. They don't want to change. Yeah, they'll have to change. Yes. Anything else? It's easier not to do anything. Yeah, it's to do anything. Why would well, that's fine. It's fine, it's easy, we, shouldn't, we don't need to do this. People, some people will still come and use us, that's okay, isn't it? So to actually do this, you have to be motivated, and you have to be able to see, yes, we will get more people in, and we'll get happier people, we'll get people using more of our services. But you have to have the will in advance. This brings me to my favourite pie chart in the history of the world. And it's all about how much time libraries spend researching with their users. Okay? So, any guesses what the pink bit of pie might be? I'll tell you. This is the amount of time that library staff spend speculating and discussing user needs. Talking about their users in the pink. That tiny, tiny slither of blue pie that would not fill you up at lunch, that is actual research into user needs and behaviours. And this is what I see all over the planet. People not spending the time researching. Guessing, discussing, but not researching. Maybe a few surveys, maybe a bit of talking to users, but not nearly enough. And it's my view that we should be spending more of our time as library staff actively researching what people are doing in our libraries through watching them, through talking to them, through using all the different methods I'm going to mention today. Question, should we provide everything that our users ask for? There's a few people saying no. 
quite strongly. That's a quite strong way of saying no in front of all of these people. Well done. I like the confidence of that. I agree. We shouldn't. No. Why shouldn't we ask, do everything they want? <laughs> they don't actually know what they need. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, they don't actually know what they need. Absolutely true. Um, some people think that the purpose of UX is just to find out what people want and then to give it to them. It's not that at all. Um, if we implemented the services based on their views, that would be disastrous because we don't always have the money, things aren't always feasible. It may be that it's not part of the mission of the library to do this thing that they ask for. But most of all, as the person said, people don't know what they need or what they want. And what people think they want and what they actually need are often very different things. So it's not good enough just to ask people. You have to go beyond that. I love this quote. What people say, what people do, and what people say they do are entirely different things. Have you found that to be true in your life? Yeah, it's so true. I tell lies all the time about what I do. Not like deliberately, I'm not a mean person, I'm not a, a big liar, but it's just easier just to smooth the way. Oh, just, oh yeah, this, that and the other, you know. Um, yeah, but often we have to push, push through this surface reaction of what people say they do to find out what they actually do. So UX work is about needs and behaviours. We should talk and listen to our users, but we should also watch them. Observe with our eyes how they use our spaces, our furniture, signage, and digital services. If we can learn about their behaviours, how they actually use the library, as well as gathering the needs they express, then we can truly improve the services we offer. Unfortunately, our focus is too much on just talking to people. Okay, all of this is fine, Andy, but why not just use surveys and statistics? We've been using them for years, they tell us enough, don't they? So, some problems with surveys. Only a small percentage of users respond. Survey fatigue. People don't want to fill them in anymore. Even more so since the pandemic, because the pandemic made people go completely online. Surveys just increased so much. And very few people fill them in. And the people who do fill them in are people who are either really happy or really angry. And the people in between, sorry, the people in between <laughs> um, are not represented. And they're the people you want to find out about because they're the most of, your, of the people, your, most of your users. Responses are also often superficial and open to interpretation. People will tell you just the, the start of, of how they really feel. They tell you what people say or think they need, but not necessarily what they actually need. Surveys can offer some value, but if you're, if you're relying on them as the only source of information on the experience of your users, they're not enough. Also, survey responses rarely offer new or innovative ideas on how to develop or improve services. Would a survey have helped Henry Ford, the inventor of the motor car? No. He didn't come up with a motor car by going on a survey to people who said, what do you think we should do to make travel faster? He knew this. He actually said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. They would never have come up with a motor car. Never thought of it. And if you apply that to libraries, we've got a similar problem. When people respond on library surveys, it's obvious that most library users don't know what change is possible or what we can really provide to them. In fact, the majority of people ask for the equivalent of a faster horse. So they say, more books and longer opening hours. That is the equivalent of the faster horse. Because they can't think, what else could it be? So if we're only asking people what they want, we're never going to get to the innovation, to the things that we should really try, things that we know about that we could be testing with users. We need to go deeper. 
OK, so then we have the problem of usage statistics. So surveys are problematic, but usage statistics are also difficult. They tell you that someone has used something, they've visited the library, they've loaned something, they've used a database, but you don't know anything about whether that's a good or a bad experience. Also, they involve zero user interaction. So they're counted, maybe as you walk in, or when you're using something online, but we don't know what that actually means or how good or bad that experience was. And the user is not talked to. Statistics are valuable supporting evidence, but we need UX for illumination. So we've got this problem of distance versus interaction as well. It's my experience that some library staff choose to gather data via surveys and statistics because it keeps the user away from them. Some library staff don't want to interact with users. I don't think it's so true in public libraries. I think in public libraries, people are there more because they want to talk to users, they want to help them. But I also work with university libraries. Let's be rude about university libraries for a bit because there's no, there's no university librarians in the room. <laughs> but your national libraries, your university libraries, often the staff there are just become librarians so they can hide. They don't want to actually help people. And it's a big problem. And that's why they choose to use surveys and statistics, because they don't really want to change anything, because it means they have to talk to people. While that was appropriate during COVID, this needs to change. We, we can't keep our distance any longer. We need to interact and reach great understanding through talking to people. So don't keep your distance, is my message today. Unless you have a cold, <laughs> then in which case, probably wear a mask. So surveys and statistics cannot tell you enough about real user needs or their actual behaviours. To uncover the truth and complexity of people's experience of the library, you need to employ a new set of methods, U UX research methods. I got so excited, I even include, included an old-style PowerPoint firework on that slide. <laughs> I was like, should I use that? No one uses that sort of animation anymore, but I thought it was kind of postmodern. I decided. <laughs> so, what are these methods? Um, all of these. You've probably done some of these. Um, interviews. You know what interviews are. Usability testing. You've probably done a bit of that, where you sit alongside someone and see how they use a product. You may have done graffiti walls where you ask people to write up what they think. Some of these will be familiar to you, others less so. All of these are part of the UX toolkit, all of these methods. And I'm just going to cover a few of these now in this presentation. And then later this afternoon, I have a workshop in which you can try out some of these methods if you signed up for the, my workshop. So we're going to start with behavioral mapping. This is great fun. This is really good. This is when you record how people move through a physical space by just watching them. And you do a map. Great fun. You get to play with pens. You get to sit there and draw. You get to watch people. You get to be a bit of a spy. Who likes watching people? Some hands went up. I was surprised. More, usually more than that. Um, why would you use it? To identify the key routes through a space and the efficacy of layout, furniture, and other equipment. In other words, is the space laid out right? Is the furniture in, in the right place? Is the equipment in the right place? And crucially, these key routes, are they correct? These are known as desire lines. So, as you came into this room, the main desire line was down the center. And I think that's just because it's natural, it's the bigger space than this line here, so everyone filed in around there. But wherever, wherever, you are, ooh, wherever you are, you can find out where a desire line is in a space. And it's usually guided by furniture. And you can change that desire line so people can move around a space in a different way. You might change the desire line in order to get them to see something they hadn't seen before, or to um, use a different part of the library. So I did some work at Schuster Public Library in Stockholm, and when we did behavioral mapping there, we discovered that no one was using that large newspaper display cabinet. 
and that more room was needed in this area for people to study, where they could also eat and drink. So I sat there and behavioural mapped this area, and we came up with this conclusion. So what we did next was we prototyped, we tested. We removed the newspapers to another room. There was a lot of people who wanted to bin the newspapers, by the way. Oh, no one's using them in this room. Let's just bin them. Let's get rid of them. It's really easy to overreact to research data. I said, no, let's try them in a different room. And in this other room, they were used better. So don't overreact. You're just testing. We brought in more study desks and signage, which encouraged eating and drinking. And we had a new area. There it is. Now, you may look at that and be a bit worried because there's wires on the floor. It's a prototype, it's a test. You're just seeing if it works. And I think pretty soon we put down those cable runs so that it was more safe. But um, the point is we tested very quickly. People voted with their feet. They came in and used this area and we discovered that this was a much better area. And it was used. And that was all done through behavioral mapping. Another method, love and breakup letters. This is the writing of a letter to the library as if it's a person with whom the user is in love or whom they have fallen out of love with. So, dear library, I love you with all my heart. These are all the reasons why. Or, dear library, I'm breaking up with you. I've had enough of your opening hours or your uncomfortable furniture or your silly signage or your rude staff or whatever it is. So it's encouraging people to write letters. And you'd be surprised how many people are very happy to do this. You have to tell them, don't worry, you can't upset us. Please be honest with us. We want to find out the truth. So these were two um, Chinese ladies in Singapore. And they wrote endless letters. And I was like, yeah, we just need one page. They kept writing. <laughs> good, hooray, good. People love to do it. Um, so these letters help you to explore more emotional and hidden feelings. And it's because the user, this difficult word in English, anthropomorphize the library. They think of it as a person. And if you think of a, a physical thing or a service as a human and then write to it, people will bring out all these emotions, these thoughts and feelings that they wouldn't be able to express otherwise. So this is why this works. So here's a letter. Dear all, I come here with my grandson to borrow books and DVDs. So far, the experience has been enjoyable and enriching for us, especially for our grandson. But I wish there was one section where we could provide opportunities for intergenerational reading with collections for adults in the same section. This may not be feasible, but hope this can be considered for future planning. Thank you. So in this one letter, this one woman is saying, can't we have books for adults near the books for children? Which makes sense. So this, these sort of letters can give you insights into things you wouldn't have thought of. So I did this work in Singapore public libraries, and we discovered that the collections were in the wrong places, or they didn't fit with routines and preferences, and that people also weren't aware of the available technology there. So what we did was we enhanced the collection layout, we marketed services better, and we did further research into user routines. I think the favorite thing that we discovered there um, through the letters was that a lot of the Chinese population said, the books are really far away. And I didn't know what that meant. What do they mean far away? So it wasn't until we started watching people and we discovered that the books in this one library were on the fourth floor. And the Chinese population who used the library were all much older than the rest of the population using the library. And the library was forcing all these old Chinese people to the top floor to get their books. And if they just watched them, they could have seen, this is a problem. Let's move the Chinese collection downstairs, because the older they want quicker access. However, when we tested it, there was a problem. What was the problem? What did some of the users then complain about? They saw that the collection was there. Some people were happy. Yes, we can just grab a book now. It's near the desk. Some of the Chinese population were saying, but that was my exercise for the day. I liked that they were upstairs, because that's the way I knew I would have that walk. So you're not always solving it for everyone. But you test. You try it out. Right. Generative play. 
This is a posh way of saying you play with Lego, basically, or other modeling things, clay, other creative materials. I use Lego all the time. I haven't got any with me today. I'm a trained Lego serious play facilitator. That basically means I get paid to play with Lego. Hooray! Um, I'm going to Australia next month, and I'm taking a massive suitcase of Lego with me. I'll be playing with Lego a lot. The purpose of using Lego for research is to ask people to build things that are their experience. Build problems in the library. Build how you feel about how staff interact with you. Build the perfect library. And by getting them to do this through models, you get completely different insights from a survey or from just talking to people. So you explore user feelings and ideas in response to their experiences. And it's more creative and it's free. Not everyone likes it. With all of these methods, two or three people are, oh, I'm not playing with Lego. No, 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 not doing it. And that's fine. Just remember that a lot of people want the opportunity to be creative to try things. So I was working at another public library in Stockholm, in Valingbu, and here teenagers built Lego models that revealed that their library did not have enough space set aside for them. And crucially, they were so angry that the children's library for younger kids was right next to the youth section. They're like, I've grown up. I don't want to be near the kids anymore. I hate the fact that it's nearby. I want it the other side of the library because I don't want to see these kids anymore. I'm not that. I'm older, you know? And these Lego models all reflected the fact that they wanted the youth section somewhere else and they wanted lots of other facilities in it. So we prototyped a youth, a youth corner separate from the children's library with a seating area, graphic novels, games, and study tables. And we tested that, and it was successful. So investment was done in that area. Usability testing. This is for research digitally. Observing and recording how a user completes a set of tasks on a website or other digital platform. This is a group of library staff at Almera, Univers um, sorry, Almera Public Library in the Netherlands. We'd set them a task, see if you can find these books, how do you get on, and the most simple things trip them up. And it's not until you see people doing this on your website or your catalogue that you realise, ah, oh, this is difficult. Um, you use this to uncover problems that need resolving around digital navigation, layout, and accessibility. I did some work at the State Library of South Australia in Adelaide on their family history website. During testing, we saw that people observed to use, really struggled to use this collection, even those users whose staff considered to be experts. So we'd invited all these people in who used the website regularly, and they all, all the staff were like, this is a waste of time. They all know how to use this website. But let's just see. Let's find out. We sat them down, we set some simple tasks, and nine out of ten people couldn't complete these simple tasks. And these were meant to be experts. Through testing, through watching them try to use these things, we discovered that they needed more help. And these were the people who, who thought they were very good at it. Um, so we simplified the navigation, we changed the language that was used, and we rearranged the layout to make it more uh, efficient and appropriate. There's always things you can improve, but getting users to try them out, to see how they go wrong, is so valuable. Who likes to draw? Anyone here likes to draw? One person. That's a bit depressing. Two, three. <laughs> We're just listening, Andy. We just want to listen. Don't worry. Um, this is getting users to draw their experience of using the library. Um, so you can see this person here, this user, is happily drawing away. It's a happy place. She loves to draw. Um, this is to understand views on library strengths, weaknesses, and problems in a more visual way. When people draw, they process their thoughts in a completely different way. So here's another example. At this particular library, users drew pictures that showed they did not understand how collections were laid out, or what was held at the library, and these maps, these drawings, help to explain um, what was going on. Now, the problem with these maps, these drawings, often is, what the hell is going on? What, what does that mean? 
and you can't guess. Before the user goes, you have to say, can you tell me what this means? And you write down a set of notes that you put next to the drawing so you can understand it, because you won't remember. I mean, I, I'm looking back at this now. This is only a few months ago, and I remember there was something about angry staff at the top, and there's something about wanting it to be cozy, somewhere they could sleep. Um, there was a lot around confusion, and they didn't know where to go. But you need to write comprehens comprehensive notes. So we prototyped new collection signage, floor plans, and more intuitively arranged and located collections that people could navigate around better. If you're coming to my workshop this afternoon, we'll be doing some cognitive mapping, some drawing. So if you signed up and you hate drawing, you know, just don't turn up. No, I'm joking. OK, so you've done all these different research methods, and that was just a selection. You've got this user research data. What do you do next? Just checking on my time. Well, these are your typical next steps that I don't want you to do ever, but it's what everyone does. Only solve the easy stuff. There's some problems we've got. Let's just solve those, because they're quick. Put up more signs. People always do this. Oh, this is a problem. Let's put up a sign. No. Putting up a sign doesn't help. My favorite story about signs um, and how library staff would never have solved this in a million years. When credit cards were introduced, and um, you could get money, sorry, not credit cards, um, debit cards, and you could get money out of the wall for the first time, because it used to be you have to queue up. Is anyone old enough to remember going into the bank and queuing up at lunch times and stuff to get the money? Yeah. Um, well, once the hole in the wall was produced and you could get money from outside of the bank, there was a massive problem. Does anyone know what that massive problem was? Huge problem. And it happened all around the world in exactly the same week. People were forgetting their card. And the reason was that it used to be that you'd get your card out after your money. So people were taking their money and leaving their card all over the planet. And then all the lost card hotlines rang off the hook all around the world. People saying, I've lost my card, I've lost my card, all over the world. Just imagine that noise. Now, I think if librarians had been asked to solve this problem, what they would have done is at every cash machine, they would have put up a sign saying, please don't forget to take your card. That's not a solution. There's got to be a design solution. For everything, there's a design solution to a problem. What was the design solution? Yes. First your card, then your money. And too often in libraries, we solve things by putting up a sign, when instead, we need to think about the design process. Another thing that people love to do, let's form a committee. We love committees, don't we? All these faces of joy that I see before me. Some committees can be OK, but it's rare. Often, it's just a chance to talk and have coffee and eat biscuits. Um, some people just go to complain. Some people to complain about the same things. Committees are difficult. Thankfully, there are a few of them in public libraries, loads in universities. Finally, write a report that no one reads. That's popular. I used to have to write reports when I was at Cambridge University. I was the most prolific author at Cambridge University Library because I was forced to write reports. I knew I could write rude words in there because no one was ever going to read them. People don't read reports. They might read your executive summary, but they won't go beyond that. These are not good steps after you've done your research. What I'm going to tell you now is what you should do next after you've researched. So you've done your research. There you go. I've already told you. You sort your data. You have an idea generation session. And then you prototype new services. Hooray! And this is the basis for an internationally recognized process model, which is called the double diamond model. So this isn't just me saying, I've invented this model, it's great. This is an internationally recognized model. This is my version of it. So this is just a more complicated version of the previous slide. You start by discovering user needs, then you define them, then you develop them into prototypes that you test, and then you deliver them. And once you've worked out what is the best version of that, and you invest in it. So at the end, at the finish there, you're investing in the product. 
when people ask me how long this process takes, I get terrified because they think, so is this over like a few months or maybe a year? I'm like, no, a few days or a week at the most. People are so slow. You can do this quick, quickly do the research, get the data up on a wall on post-its. All right, this is what they want to do. Well, let's come up with some ideas. All right, we'll try this, test it inexpensively, just with the materials you have in your own library and then see whether it works or not. A few days, you've done it. People think this is a massive, long process. You can see in the middle there, there's, there's heads with cogs whirring. This is perhaps the most important part of the process that people forget. And that is UX, more than anything else, is about a mindset. It's not necessarily about the process or the exact techniques. It's about having a mindset that you want to try and do this stuff and improve the library. So you can see it moves between divergent and convergent. What that basically means is, at the start of the process, you can see the arrows are open. You're open to whatever the users might say. You don't know what it is at the start. You're going to listen. You're going to be open and divergent. Then, when you found out what all the data is, you're convergent. So I can't do it that way around. I can't move my microphone. <laughs> you can see it anyway. Convergent, where you're deciding, this is the problem we're going to focus on. Then. When you're having an idea generation session, you need to be open to any possibility, any idea, any prototype, however mad it might sound. You don't worry about money or feasibility to begin with. So you're divergent again, you're open. And then when you decide on the final version of your prototype that you invest in, you have to be convergent again. You're focusing in. The problem is that we have been trained since we were little kids to be convergent. Most of us on the planet are convergent. And that means we don't remain open to possibility enough. We're too serious, we're too conservative, and we need to spend time in an open thinking space where anything is possible. And this is also a crucial part of UX. We are, does anyone know at what age we are at our most convergent? Sorry, divergent. At what age are we at our most open to ideas? Yeah, what age when we were little? Five. Five years old. At five year olds, we are the most open we can be in our lives. Everything else is downhill after that. It's really sad, but what happens at five? People go to school. And suddenly the, at school, the focus is too much on the correct answers and um, things being right or wrong. And the openness is taught out of children. And one thing that I struggle with the most when I'm trying to do this process with library staff is they need to think like children again. They need to take off all of their societal conventions and pressures and what it is to be professional. And they come up with crazy ideas that we test. And then we come up with some really wonderful, innovative library services. So it's just as much about mindset as it is about, um, about the process. The first stage here in the blue is UX research. A lot of people stop at UX research. They do the research, they've got loads of data, and then they just put it in a drawer. Or they go to a committee, or they write a report. They don't do any of the next three things, and that is UX design, or service design, if, if you prefer. And this is when you do all the other stages. This is missed by most libraries. You have to go and do your design. You have to sort your data, you have to come up with ideas, and you have to test actual physical prototypes or digital prototypes. OK, just checking my time. So affinity mapping is the process of sorting and analyzing your data. I do this with Post-its. I keep Post-its in business. I spend so much money on Post-its. Um, if you ever wondered why they do so well, it's, it's down to me. I buy them all. Um, and this is the best way of sorting your data. You write down what people have said, and you put it on the wall in themed groups. It's called affinity mapping. And this way you can identify the most common problems, the things that people keep saying, and you put them on a large wall or window. And it looks like that. If you've got enough data, this is actually probably too much data, it's a lot here. So problems I put on pink, ideas people have on orange, um, on yellow there was, um, I'm trying to think what yellow is now. Oh, that's when things 
people have said that they like things. So praise is on, on yellow. And then on blue is the things that people saw people do that were, were a problem. So you code into each group. So this middle group here is about furniture. And these are all things that you can then generate ideas from. This is how I code all of my data. I don't do any of it into a computer. I don't sit there discussing it. It's all there on the wall so people can tangibly touch it and, and interact with it. Then I do idea generation. Once you've sorted all, sorted all your data, it's time to decide what can we come up with. So you can see some examples there. Make all the toilets free. There's this one library I worked at in Cologne in Germany where the biggest problem was the fact that people had to pay to use the toilets. And we couldn't get past this problem because no none, none of the users had anything else other than this problem because it was the worst one. You have to solve hygiene issues before you can move on to anything... What word? Sexy. You can't move on to sexy stuff until you solve things like heating and, and food and drink and toilets. You have to sort those things first. Um, it's really important when you do ideation that you set time aside so that loud and confident people like me don't dominate. You have to have everyone, regardless of how loud and confident they are, getting involved. And that's why it's really important that individuals come up with ideas as well. And again, I use post-its so everyone else can write down their ideas. And then you put them together on a wall. Everyone's contributed. Um, also, ideation should not be constrained by money, feasibility, or opinion. You need to have an open setting where every, every idea is a good idea. And you know really that the idea that this person had was terrible. But you don't say that. It's about being open and respectful. Later on, you'll just get rid of it quietly. But at the time when you're coming up with ideas, everyone must feel that their ideas count. And the ideas worth pursuing are explored as prototypes. Then you prototype. Testing with your users the service ideas and seeing what they think of them by getting their feedback and their behavior. One of the most important reasons for prototyping is it's really cheap. Because you're quickly and cheaply discovering what actually works before you spend any money. So for public libraries, who tend to have much less money, it's a really good approach. You're testing it with materials you already have to see if it works. Then you get support to get some money spent, hopefully. And this is another important point. Failure is an essential part of the learning process. Too much of the time, we try to be perfect as library staff. We want services to be perfect straight away. We do these big launches without testing with users enough. And then they fail, or people don't use them. And it's a real shame, and we get upset about it. But it's because we're trying to avoid failure too much. If we accept failure and prototype and say, we know this isn't perfect, but we're just going to try it out before we spend any money, then we can accept failure and work our way towards something that will work for the user. We should stop striving for immediate perfection. It's a big problem. Have you heard of the phrase, perfect is the enemy of good? Sometimes we just have to be good enough. OK, so in my remaining few minutes, I'm just going to talk about three different public library prototypes that I was involved with recently. So I was working at the International Library in Stockholm. And the idea of this prototype, based on the data, was to make the International Library more international. Because we discovered that the users of the library didn't actually know it was meant to be an international library with lots of different languages. I thought that the team who did this prototype were just going to put flags up all over the library. But through too much discussion, they spent far too long discussing. I was like, get up, get out, go into the library, try stuff. Um, they felt that flags could be dangerous because they were quite, um, the, the idea of it being nationalistic and too much worry about, about patriotism. Because um, in Sweden, the, 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 the national national um, nationalization of Sweden, the sort of the far right is becoming quite strong. So they didn't want to use the flags. So it was a lot more emphasis on languages. So one of the things they did was put up a graffiti wall asking, what language do you speak? And you can see the different reactions there. Then they also put different languages on the stairs. So they put up some um, different colored flags on the wall that just were showing, it was just really just to highlight that the prototype was happening. They made um, globe balloons. I don't think that's particularly accurate. 
um, globe. <laughs> but you get the idea. They're trying to say things in the space that suggest this is an international library. Um, but the one that they really were excited about was this tree on the ground, a hierarchical tree of different languages and where they had come from. And they thought, if we put this on the floor, if we prototype it in this way first, and then actually get an artist to do it properly, it would really signify that this is an international library with all these different languages. And the staff got really excited about it. They also put welcome in different languages on the glass door going into the library. What did the public think? They didn't notice it. They just walked over it. They didn't see it in the doorway. Um, so all that excitement was suddenly tempered by the fact when you actually talk to users about what they've seen and what they think, that in reality, none of these prototypes were hitting home. They weren't connecting with them. And when they stopped and they talked more to users, they discovered that what actually really needed to change was the labeling on the shelves because the people coming to this library were not finding their language collection in the place where they thought it should be. So, through more research, we discovered that everything we were doing was not really helping, and that there's something practical and simple needed to be done to make the collections more findable. Okay, another prototype. This was decorating library study rooms. We discovered that in one library that was particularly used by students, it was a public library, but lots of people there using it for academic study. Some people said, this library has rooms that feel like prison. I feel like I'm in prison. It's so, it's so white and cold. So what we thought we'd do as a prototype, we had an idea session, was to decorate the study rooms. So they were decorated with album covers from the library collection, with plants, um, we put material on the wall, cushions. Again, the staff got really excited about it. Really excited. And this is the staff saying, look, this is what we've done, we really like it. And at this point, where he looks a bit confused, I'm saying, have you actually talked to users yet about what they think? Do they like it? Oh, yeah, we're getting around to that. We haven't done that yet. So what did the users think? Oh, God, I would never work in here. I hate it. It's awful. I don't want music albums on my, on my wall, I don't want to plant there. And basically, we asked this guy to change it to how he'd want it. He removed everything. <laughs> it was ex back exactly to where we'd started from. Um, he was an extreme example. Some other people said, oh, I like the cushion, oh, I like the plant. And we came to a sort of middle ground. The team were very excited about, about lights, fairy lights. So you can see some fairy, fairy lights that they tried, but again, no one was interested. Ultimately, this was, the, this was the final version, which was based on collaboration with the users and what they wanted. So uh, a table lamp, there was a cushion on the chair, and also just a, just a section of wallpaper on the wall to suggest this is something slightly inspirational, but it's not too in your face like the album cover. It just feels like a clean, nicely designed room, and I can study here more appropriately. So the key message of that story is you must talk to your users, find out what they like. It's not about what you like. The library isn't for you, but I think we forget that sometimes. Finally, encouraging use of smart boxes. So at Stockholm Public Library, they have, in lots of different libraries, these big boxes that have got screens in them that show poetry or little clips, arty clips of films. And through observation, we noticed that no one was looking at them. There were seats inside of them, but no one would sit in them. So one of the ideas was to see if we could get people to use them and sit in them as study spaces, or as spaces just to sit and relax and read. So they started to decorate. And we thought we'd put something on the screen. And I think the idea of this room originally was about poetry. But we moved it on, and eventually we came up with this, this kind of cosy fireside log cabin sort of feel. So we invited users to come into the space and sit there and see what they thought. The people we asked to come in liked it a lot. And they said, oh, yeah, this is lovely. It's cosy. But there was only one of them. And people were reluctant to go there because they felt like they were on show, like they were almost in a piece of art. So they didn't want to sit there. And all of these arrows were put up by staff saying, come and use this, come and use this, use the, follow these arrows, which were ignored. No one followed the arrows. 
So the answer was to create another box. So alongside the log cabin box, we created a rainforest box where there were sounds of the rainforest coming through. And at this point, once there were two of them, two of these sort of boxes, people started to come and use them. You can see someone's in there, just sat there in the dark, quite cosy. There's someone in the next one as well. So through decorating both the boxes and coming up with a theme, we got people into these spaces and they were used. That was through prototyping. I should say the prototyping I've shown you today are all in the physical space, but I also do digital prototyping as well, creating apps to help people, um, usually starting on paper just to see how people would use something and then moving into a simple prototype. But for training purposes, I usually start in the physical space because it's something everyone can get involved with and see. It's tangible. It's there in front of them. One of my closing things I wanted to say is that failure is success in progress. We have to fail in order to succeed. User experience methods are so important and valu valuable because the following reasons. They focus on user needs and behaviors. We uncover richer and more detailed and complex data. There's better engagement and connection with your users. You need to prototype and test until you succeed, and that's all part of the process. And make services that are more valuable, desirable, and relevant to your users. These are all the things we need to stop doing and all the things we need to start doing. This is it's from my book. Stop speculating. Stop holding endless meetings. Stop furthering your private and personal agendas. Stop devising services in isolation from your users. Communicate with your users, research with them, collaborate with them, co-create with them. Why UX now? Because of COVID, the world has changed forever. We need to respond to that. How have user needs and behaviors altered? How do you deliver services differently? Which services should be delivered remotely and which in person? What are the user priorities now in a physical space? And what are their priorities online? And how can you fit into user routines as the library? Libraries need to know about the current user needs and behaviors and respond to that. And that is why I think UX research and design work is essential now in libraries everywhere. Good news. If you put your users at the heart of your process, as UX does, then they are the heart of your library service, and it simply cannot fail. Voila. <laughs>